Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He is an award-winning Wall Street analyst. He's also co-authored two books with former investment banker and founder of Gold Money, James Turk. The first book was about the dollar collapse back in 2004. His second book, which I want to really ask him about today because they talked about currency swap lines and the history of those in the book is The Money Bubble, What to Do Before It Pops. That was written, I believe, in 2014. John Rubino, thank you for joining me again. Hey, Jason. Good to talk to you. It's been a while. And we just have even crazier things coming out lately. We're recording this interview on Wednesday, March 29th, 2023 for our listeners out there. So just in the last, what, two, three, four weeks, we've had Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, all these small and regional banks, and then the problems with Credit Suisse happen. Do you think a lot of these problems now are the culmination of 12 months of Federal Reserve Bank rate hikes? Well, yeah, the, the Fed has been tightening for quite a while, and they, they raised interest rates at one of the fastest paces ever and engineered a decrease in the money supply. M2 very seldom goes down, but it went down in the past year. Uh, and so everybody's been sitting around waiting. I mean, the consensus, the 99% consensus in the financial markets was that the Fed would keep tightening until it broke something. But it turns out they'd already broken a bunch of things. You know, the um, the regional and local banks were getting ready to blow up, which isn't that big of a surprise looking back on it, because the, the basic business model of a, uh, a small bank is to borrow short, in other words, take in deposits, and then lend longer, a business loan or mortgage or something like that. And for that to work, you need a uh, positively sloping yield curve. Well, the Fed had engineered a uh, an inverted yield curve for a long time, one of the deepest, most inverted yield curves ever, which makes small banks inherently unprofitable. And at the same time it did that, um, rising long-term interest rates made the price of bonds go down. So any bank with bonds um, that it's holding to maturity has to report the paper gains of losses on those securities, which means all these little banks have to report the big losses on the uh, the decrease in the, the market value of their bonds. And that scares people into pulling money out of the banks and, and makes them have to sell the, more bonds in order to pay off those depositors, which may, means another big negative earnings report and so on until you get a, an electronic bank run, basically, you know, a, a, an inter, on internet time this time. Um, and then Silicon Valley Bank had some specific things going on that uh, that are almost funny. But basically, the Fed had broken the banking system in general. And um, they're still kind of struggling to fix it. And they haven't quite yet. I mean, Janet Yellen's, did you see Janet Yellen's um, testimony before Congress? It was unbelievable. It was um, our Treasury Secretary not understanding how the banking system worked and not understanding the policies that they had put into place to try to stop the implosion of the banking system. So it was it was shocking. But as of right now, it seems like the banks are at least temporarily stabilized. Um, but of course, it comes at a cost of, you know, the end of QT, the Fed's balance sheet is going back up again, uh, which means the money supply might start growing again, which means maybe we're done with tight money. You know, the Fed did in, in raise interest rates a little bit again one more time, but I, I think they're close to the end. And it wouldn't be at all a surprise if by the end of the year they were cutting again because some other thing blew up or the banks go back to imploding or something. But, um, you know, the short answer is yes, they've done so much damage that uh, I, I think they don't need to tighten anymore if they want to squeeze inflation out of the system. Uh, and they're probably going to have to ease pretty soon to stop deflation from coming back with a vengeance when a bunch of big entities start blowing up. I think the pain has really just started in the last month or so. I mean, the stock market was still rallying. Asset prices were still at really high levels. Most of them were anyway, except for commodities or most of the commodities anyway, especially the commodities that are sensitive more to economic growth and the actual real economy rather than gold. But uh, the comments from Jerome Powell recently were actually very similar to the comments that Jerome Powell made during the 2019 repo crisis. So the Fed's balance sheet, for our listeners not familiar, the Fed's balance sheet increased by about a trillion dollars officially in only about two months. 
during the 2019 repo crisis. And the Fed said, we're not doing quantitative easing. This is not money creation, not quantitative easing. We're just giving out emergency loans. And then all of a sudden, you started to see all the things, John, that we're accustomed to seeing post-2008 with these currency swap lines. And in what back in 2019, they, they were extending the currency swap lines to longer and longer durations. And then eventually, the Fed's balance sheet just expanded. Do you expect similar types of like rules changes and bailouts and hidden shenanigans to continue? Well, I think they'll do all kinds of things when um, something else big breaks because they don't have very many tools left. Um, if easy money doesn't work, which it probably won't work, because we, we found out what happens with extremely easy money in the last few years, right? We um, flooded the system with cash to bail out what we perceive to be uh, an impending disaster. And, and then we got inflation. We got eight 0.7% inflation officially last year in the US, and it was probably something quite a bit higher than that. So let's say 12% real inflation. That is a catastrophe in a fiat currency system. So to the extent that people think now that easy money is no longer in the Fed's toolbox on any scale, like they, they can't do an, a 2020 bailout again going forward, uh, that means we've got a really messy system. The next time something blows up, um, the Fed doesn't have its main tool. It can't just flood the system with cash. So it'll have to do all kinds of things, you know, swap line related things and and um, guarantees and things like that, and maybe direct equity purchases. It's going to have to do a lot of things that it hasn't done or, or hasn't relied on solely in the past. And I think there's a pretty good chance that people don't trust that stuff anymore. So the Fed will try and fail to engineer the next big bailout, and then all hell breaks loose. You know, fiat currency cannot survive if um, if we don't believe that the government has the tools to maintain its value. You know, you take that away, and there's nothing there. There is no reality for a, a currency that's just a made up thing like a fiat currency. Yeah, it just seems that they every time there's a crisis, the response makes things even worse. And then the bankers don't learn anything from it. They learn that the Fed and the governments need to and the other central banks need to set up new bailout facilities because what we had the 2019 repo madness crisis and the Fed's response to this, they created two permanent repo facilities. The first permanent repo facility is for foreign central banks so they can place their U.S. treasuries as collateral without dumping all of their treasuries so they can get access to do U.S. dollars and borrow there. Although I think Kyle Bass recently said in tweets, he was talking about how the the um, borrowing costs to borrow from that facility are higher than borrowing in other places. But still, that's access to emergency dollars and basically kind of a, a place where the Fed could, if they want, they could buy those U.S. treasuries and sweep them under the rug off balance sheet. And then you have that other permanent repo facility that was created after the 2019 repo crisis that a lot of people haven't talked about yet. That might be used soon. That's for like real estate investment trusts, money market funds. It doesn't have to just be for banks. That's the, the permanent domestic repo facility. I did videos on this in the past. It looks to me, John, we're having similar problems um, to the 2019 repo crisis because the last rate hiking cycle we had, what back in 2019, that ended in 2019, that also broke a lot of stuff with leveraged bond trades. But now it looks like the problems, like you said, are with the regional banks. But I think the biggest bubble that looks like it's coming close is commercial real estate. Yes, I was going to bring that up. Commercial real estate looks like a, a prime candidate for the bubble that bursts this year and forces the Fed back to cutting. Because, you know, uh, an awful lot of money got borrowed in the last few years at extremely low rates to buy things like office buildings that have turned out to have really low occupancy rates. They're not making nearly as much cash flow um, as they as it was hoped that they would, in part because of the, uh, the pandemic um, leading so many people to work at home who don't want to come back to work now in the office. Um, and um, in part, just because there's too much commercial real estate for the world configured as it is. Um, so what happens when the debts that were taken on to buy these buildings in previous years has to be rolled over at these much higher rates? Now, a lot of these buildings weren't very profitable to begin with at the lower rates, and now they're going to be wildly unprofitable. And you're going to see a lot of big real estate um, uh, companies go bust 
that's the theory anyhow and we'll see if it plays out that way but uh, a lot of that debt is being rolled over now and it, a lot of others uh, debt will continue to roll over in the next couple of years so at some point that becomes a front page story uh, and it could be sooner rather than later because people are liable to front run it it, it could be that um everybody's anticipating in that business trouble when those debts have to roll over um, and they're taking steps to de-risk, you know, to not be involved in that risk when the when it hits the fan. So, yeah, um, commercial real estate is a, a big mess impending. And and so are pension funds and so are derivatives. And, uh, and there's just an awful lot of stuff that can go wrong out there if interest rates stay this high or even go higher for a while. Powell is saying, you know, they're going to be higher longer than you think. And they're you shouldn't be as optimistic with stocks. So I, I think he's trying to, um, he feels like his back is against the wall, that if he doesn't break the back of inflation, including asset inflation, then he can't legitimately stop raising rates. And he really wants to stop raising rates, but he can't let inflation come back. So he's trying to talk the stock market down and and set us up for disappointment and everything. And and nobody wants to hear it because everybody assumes the Fed is going to go back to easing right away because we've been conditioned to think that. So it's an interesting game of chicken that's going on out there. And um, there, there are any number of things that can go wrong that would kind of decide which direction we go. But, uh, you know, if the banking thing is settled, then we have to wait for the next thing. But you, you never know with the banking thing. Because did, did you see that the UBS CEO just resigned? No, so it the, doesn't. It doesn't surprise me. I mean, like they have loss guarantees in writing from the Swiss government and also the Swiss National Bank to cover any interest rate derivative losses that Credit Suisse has. But I was shocked that it was in there. Someone sent me it in writing. So it's in writing. So one of the conditions for UBS buying Credit Suisse is the Swiss government is backstopping, which means probably the Federal Reserve Bank, because we don't know how large those uh, interest rate swap losses are. But the losses are in writing, which means some government or central bank is going to be covering all these uh, problems. Well, the Swiss central bank um, originally in, in, the, in the first part of this deal um, committed something like, what was it, one-fourth of Swiss GDP or some crazy number like that um, to backstopping this deal. Uh, and it's just one bank, <laughs> and not even that big in relation to, say, Deutsche Bank or something like that, which is the next domino that might fall in the, the global banking crisis because uh, Deutsche Bank was actually in pretty good shape two weeks ago. Their stock had had been pretty stable and they were making money and everything, but every as soon as... Um, Credit Suisse got into trouble. Um, Deutsche Bank's credit default swaps went up. In other words, in, insuring their bonds got a lot more expensive and their stock price started to fall. So um, it, it's completely possible that they see um, keeping Credit Suisse from metastasizing into the rest of the banking market as their, their main obligation, no matter what it costs because they don't know who will collapse if, uh, it, you know, if Credit Suisse becomes the layman moment out there where they just let it fail or they um, they, they well, I, allow I don't think, the takeover to be messy. So I don't think they'll let it fail if there's loss guarantees right on the derivatives. It sounds like they're kind of preparing for this. I mean, some country out there drew from the Fed's permanent repo facility $60 billion in emergency draws. And now we're hearing what, in addition to these, uh, ironclad contracts the Federal Reserve Bank has with the G7 central banks, there's additional currency swap lines that are daily now. <laughs> oh, you know, we're, we stand ready to give them as many hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars as it takes <laughs> to keep some giant international bank from going bust and taking their home country down with them. Because, you know, Deutsche Bank's derivatives book is bigger than Germany's entire economy. So if derivatives blow up, in other words, if if net exposure becomes gross exposure for a big bank's derivatives book. Uh, the numbers are just overwhelming and they can't let that happen. You know, if uh, they found out in uh, 2008, 2009, what would happen if, if they hadn't bailed out AIG back then, um, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan Chase, um, and most of the other big US banks would not be here now. They would have evaporated because of derivatives. Uh, we got the global version of that coming if if somebody like Deutsche Bank goes bust. So, yeah, uh, we're not out of the woods here at all. We've just started the path 
uh, through the darkest part of the woods with interest rates having gone up the way they've gone up in the last couple of years. And then you've got all kinds of peripheral things that could become, you know, front burner, like the the energy crisis in Europe and geopolitics, like the uh, Ukraine-Russian war. And, and then there's the de-dollarization thing, which just got very real. That's the title of a thing I posted on Substack the other day. De-dollarization just got real. Uh, and that's a huge story. Even leaving this other stuff aside, if we if we don't have a financial crisis, we still could easily have a currency crisis because of de-dollarization. So um, the idea that um, things are going to calm down in any way from the past decade and the next decade is going to be calmer and more uh, you know well managed and everything is a pipe dream. It's going to be worse um, ten years from now than it is right now. So in the Money Bubble, which is your last book that you and James Turk wrote, you actually put in there some of the history of currency swap lines because James Turk was an investment banker, I believe, during the Asian tiger crisis and the tequila crisis. And he was talking about how the U.S. federal government and the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve Bank had to do emergency currency swap line during those crises, what, in the 70s and 80s in the past, but they were a lot smaller. So there's still been currency swap lines given out to try to protect these investment banks from either failing or having losses. So there are some problems where maybe a foreign investment bank fails or government or an emerging market government defaults on the debt, but the Fed and the US Treasury are routinely issuing these currency swap lines in the past, although they were orders of magnitude smaller to protect US investment bank interests. Um, yeah, th that's been a tool they've used forever, and and they used it in a big way in the 1990s. That was when Alan Greenspan bailed out everybody in sight from the Asian contagion and uh, of the Russian bond default and Mexico's near default and and uh, oh, uh, long term capital management. They they had a bunch of mini crises that uh, at, were seemed big at the time, but in retrospect seemed like laughably small. But um, each time the Fed stepped in with guarantees and currency swaps and probably a bunch of direct payments to people who were making decisions back then. And um, that was when the banks learned that they can basically do anything they want to. And uh, if, if it works, then they, they keep the profits. If it doesn't work, the government steps in and bails them out, and they still get to pay themselves record bonuses at the end of the year. And that um, that moral hazard right there is what has brought us to this point now. It's basically destroyed the global financial system. And Alan Greenspan deserves to burn in financial hell for being the guy who presided over that. You know, and just because his his successors even did big, bigger, and and nastier mistakes. Um, they probably wouldn't have been able to do that if Alan Greenspan hadn't been the guy who uh, who did the first set of moral hazard mistakes that the uh, the Fed really engaged in. Well, we also have to blame Robert Rubin and Larry Summers oh, and the yes. bank lobbyists and those guys, because if you look at the size of the derivatives market, John, I, I went back and looked this up because I was curious because I was looking, um, I was doing some research for another interview about Brooksley Bourne because she was the one person at the CFTC a couple decades ago, I think under Bill Clinton or one of those uh, presidents around then. It was uh, mid to late 90s. And uh, the derivatives market back then was around $29 trillion in, in notional value. And here we are about 20-something years later, and it's over 20x that size. So, I mean, the derivatives market, $29 trillion is enormous back then in 1998 when they got rid of Brooksley Bourne, but glass de gaulle was repealed. The derivatives market then proceeded to go up 20x in, in 20 years, but it was because what Robert Rubin, Larry Summers, Alan Greenspan, and those guys were all working together to allow the these large US banks and European banks, because there's the there's the Euro dollar market too. That was created out of thin air. That's the offshore dollar lending market. That was created from zero in the 1950s, and now it's over 15 trillion. So that's a problem too that these large European banks are involved in with all these dollar loans that uh, can't be paid. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff like this out there, and and um, so much of it doesn't really show up on bank balance sheets because they, you know, they match the liabilities with the assets, and then they net it out to some manageable number, and basically they lie, uh, and they get away with lying. So we know the numbers are astoundingly big. Um, we know they come in several several different flavors of risk, but we don't really have the faintest idea what exactly it is we're talking about. You know, these these things could can come out of nowhere. Like we found out with uh, Silicon Valley Bank, we had no idea um, 
that they had that kind of risk build up into their balance sheet. Well, the same well, thing will be true of lots of other entities when things start blowing up. Well, John, we're just starting to see over the last couple of weeks the the stuff that investigative journalists should have been doing at the beginning. So look at who was in charge of the chief risk officer who was in charge of risk management for Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, she's a woke meme. It looks like she has no um, resume experience whatsoever in terms of risk management or banking. It looks like she's only worked at a bank for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that that's where the the term woke bank is coming from. Uh, we just we, we do diversity hires for all the things that uh, don't involve schmoozing customers. Um, yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, the, Silicon Valley Bank is kind of a special case, though, because they seem to either not be aware of the FDIC insurance limits or they had some kind of a deal with somebody that uh, that made it okay for them to take the deposits that they took. Because, you know, uh, there were 10 Chinese depositors who had a, a cumulative $13 billion on deposit with Silicon Valley Bank. Now, that would be about... $12.99 billion more than the insurance covered, right? So they were massive unsecured creditors of Silicon Valley Bank. Now, who would do that um, if they understood the situation? So either they didn't know, which I I guess at this case, you can't, you know, at this point, you can't rule anything out. It's possible that. Uh, I, I think a lot of rich people considered it kind of next generation banking because there was a lot of affluent Hollywood people, Silicon Valley people. They had way over the 250,000 women at that bank. But, but, so if you're a bank and somebody deposits a million dollars with you, wouldn't you have somebody whose job it is to call them and say, now you understand how FDIC insurance works, right? And that you are now an unsecured creditor for seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars of our bank. Do you do you get that? We, we love you. We want we want to keep your business. We just want to make sure you understand what you're doing. That's if the banks um, were going to uh, put the customers first. I mean, like yes, I, I interviewed yeah. the lawyer for Bernie Madoff after like the Ponzi scheme was found out, and she was also a victim. And what she told me was that the J.P. Morgan, because Bernie Madoff told her this on the phone that the bankers knew at JP Morgan knew the whole time that Bernie Madoff was running a Ponzi scheme from the very beginning and that they didn't care because there was so much cash at Bernie Madoff's account at JP Morgan and they were just collecting fees on billions of dollars. Well, yeah, you had to know. I mean, if you knew anything about investing, you you would know that Bernie Madoff was running a scam because he was making consistent money, which nobody makes. You know, nobody makes 15% every year, right? That's That's not possible well also in, in the options world. also in the options market because the tickets were <laughs> yeah. fake i mean he can't he can't uh the split strike conversion that he was doing all the trade tickets were fake because it wasn't possible to make that much profits in with that type of options trade because the options markets weren't long enough so uh i read harry marco polis's book and i spoke with him in email messages i couldn't get him on for an interview but he was basically he laid out the case for people in like 10 minutes saying just look at the trade tickets because there's proof that the trades were never made because the options market wasn't big enough to make the in the income he claimed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and so uh, the, this Markopoulos guy saw it right away. You know, it, it was crystal clear to him, but the regulators didn't seem to get it. Or, or like you said, um, they got it and they didn't care because they were making so much money and they assumed they would get bailed out. And which, which, Probably happened. I bet not that many people lost very much money in the in the Madoff thing because, uh, you know, a lot of it still existed. But well, the, still. the government. So the government actually printed a lot of it. Congress eventually printed a lot of it, but people only got their principal back from 15, 20 years before. So if they invested with Madoff, say in like 1995 or something like that, and they were invested with Madoff for 10 or 15 years, they only got their initial principal value back. So that's it. So they yeah. did something, it's better than nothing, but they missed out on 20. Some of those people were in, involved with Madoff for 20 something years and they missed, they got all those investment returns wiped. Yeah. So basically they had a cash account sitting, earning nothing for all that time uh, with a hugely stressful year at the end of the process. So, um, I, you know, if, you, if you're in a Ponzi scheme and you get your original money back, you're one of the lucky ones. But yes, they, you know, they, he, he destroyed a lot of lives because I think a lot of people, um, they had to wait a long time for that money. 
And it wasn't all their money. They were, you know, a charitable organization or a church or something like that. Who And, and so the guys who committed that money to, to uh, Bernie Madoff, uh, probably uh, their, their lives were never the same because they, they had to be the guy who got built by Bernie Madoff with all with his their friends money and their their parishioners money and ah oh, horrible anyhow um bernie madoff is not all that out of the ordinary for today's financial world there there are well, scams look at, that are variations of that ftx is larger yeah ftx is larger than Madoff, yeah. right and that was a scam i mean okay if, if we're talking about woke companies whose risk management people don't know anything about risk management there. That's the poster child for it right there. I mean, this was a bunch of kids in the, in the Bahamas. It was, was it the Bahamas? It was a, a big mansion in an Island. Um, and, uh, and they were both basically partying while that the front man, Bankman Freed went around making speeches and stuff and collecting checks and nobody had any idea what they were doing. Um, and well, it was a money, who, it was a money laundering fraud from the get go. If you speak yeah. to Marco Hodes, but I mean, they were commingling customer funds. They weren't keeping segregated accounts. They were using customer accounts for loans for their trading services. And they, that was going, that, the whole thing was just, it reeked a fraud, but no they, one cared. They were keeping their books on QuickBooks. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the kind of thing that like a small business owner with three employees would do. Well, look at the other crypto exchanges. There's problems at all these. So the, mm-hmm. we're seeing we're seeing the tide go out with the higher interest rates and Silicon Valley is just getting wrecked. So all these they're all the problems that people should have been asking from the beginning at these crypto exchanges. No one cared until Bitcoin and crypto prices started falling and that caused and then higher interest rates. And that started causing all the problems because these companies, a lot of these Silicon Valley companies are revenue only companies and their business models. Well, we're going to sell more shares. And yes. that stops with higher interest rates. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it, schadenfreude is is a very easy thing to feel right now. And, and a lot of these guys were just so blinded by the fact that they made a little bit of money for a little while. And they thought they were geniuses. That uh, See, that's the kind of lesson. In, in, in the world of cryptos, the numbers are so exaggerated where... Normally, you know, a 27 year old kid will buy a couple of stocks because his brother in law told him about them and and they go up and he makes $10,000 and feels like a genius and then makes a, a hubristic mistake and learns that lesson, loses all his money. And but he did it with $10,000 of house money. You know, these crypto kids are doing it with millions and sometimes billions of dollars of money. But they're making very familiar mistakes. You know, they're making the the kind of mistake that you make when you have a streak of luck and think it was genius. And then you you have to have the uh, the thing happen to you after that that teaches you that markets are smarter than you before you can go on to being a legit investor. Right. Uh, but so we're watching this happen. I mean, in, in the 1990s, it happened, too, with tech stocks where people made mistakes with hundreds of millions of dollars. And now they're doing it with billions of dollars. And, you know, hopefully this is the last inflationary phase in the financial asset price markets, because um, it can't get much bigger than this. And it should not. But um, uh, the crypto guys are learning a lesson they would have needed to learn in any case in life. And they hopefully they did it mostly with other, other people's money so that the lesson is spread out really widely. Uh, and uh, And, you know, this is actually the way markets ought to work. See, the crypto market is actual capitalism where people have to eat their losses, whereas the um, the so-called traditional legit financial markets, that's not capitalism anymore. You screw up and, and the government bails you out and you still get a big bonus at the end of the year. So- yeah, I, I think, unfortunately, what we're going to see happen, John, what you brought up here, what we've seen recently with the Fed rate hikes is basically a textbook example of the Austrian School of Economics, the boom and the bust cycle. So we had this artificial boom because of artificially low interest rates, quantitative easing, these central banks that were drastically expanding their balance sheet in inflated asset prices, stocks, bonds, real estate, mostly also crypto, meme stocks, other stuff. And so you had all these people that thought that they could quit their regular job. They didn't have to build any type of difficult business. They could sell shares for their Silicon Valley company that didn't make any money. They could day trade uh, stock options or meme stocks or, or altcoins or cryptos and make like six or seven figures pretty easily and keep doing that. And it, uh, it wouldn't go away. But then when once the interest rates go higher, you have now the classic bust that's occurring. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um- 
and and busts are really good. They I would I would go out on a limb and say massive busts are the most important aspect of capitalism. You need them in order to um to allow people to see how far you can push the envelope in a given place and what you cannot do. And that teaches you know, one big bus, one big company going bankrupt and everybody losing everything teaches everybody else in that space what not to do. And you get a healthier community when that happens. But if you take that away, I mean, that's oh, the, I the term everybody yeah. uses is yeah. moral yeah. hazard now. And we've completely taken it away. So we have these crazy people out there who have no idea what it is they're doing. Yeah, it's, cap- it's um, capital discipline. So if you're a uh, commercial real estate banker and you've given out all these loans to commercial real estate, real estate investment trusts, all these development companies, and now your loans are about to default. I mean, a lot of these guys, I, I just had a conversation with a banker who posts on, he has a large Twitter account and it doesn't say his real name because that's how a lot of people are now. A lot of these professionals are have large accounts and they're posting on Twitter. This guy knew a ton of stuff about the US commercial real estate. I mean, he was telling me just details about like, it's way, way worse than you think. Um, And I have this, I wanna give you our listeners here some numbers here. This is from a New York Fed director. This guy put out this tweet on March 22nd. So a week ago when we're recording this interview, and this is from again from Scott Reckler, who's a New York Fed director, and he's laying out that there's 1.5 trillion in commercial real estate debt maturing in just the next three years. The bulk of this debt was financed when base interest rates were near zero. This debt needs to be refinanced in an environment where rates are higher, market values for the real estate are lower, and in a market with less liquidity. Let me also add that if the um landlord, the property owner, wants to raise rents, I mean, like a lot of these companies, retail restaurants, a lot of these large corporations, they're reducing commercial office space. So this just sounds like a disaster. Are they going to allow bankruptcies? And for the people who are disciplined to go and buy those commercial real estate buildings, John, for discounted prices after they crash, or is the Fed going to start doing just wide scale bailouts where the Fed's buying up trillions of dollars in commercial real estate mortgage backed securities? Um, the smaller regional banks are allowed to maybe they have mark to market accounting suspended because the large US banks have that. So maybe they're going to suspend the accounting the accounting rules for the smaller banks. <laughs> well, um, local and regional banks own a ton of commercial real estate. That's one of their business lines. So they're staring at this um, avalanche of loans that need to be refinanced, but at higher rates that might not make the it might make the um, the projects no longer viable, and then. The banks are on the hook one way or another, right? And so, yeah, though, you can't even let one bank go bust right now, right? Because of the fears of contagion. So it seems like the government's going to just be either doing a, a rolling bailout kind of thing for years where each thing that blows up, they step in and take care of it all and, and everything, or just some kind of blanket thing where they nationalize a big segment of the banking industry. Who was talking about that? I was just listening to an interview today with somebody who was saying that in in just a few years, there's only going to be six banks left in the U.S. Oh, that's and, Edward Dowd, I think. On Yes, that, on that's the guy. Yeah, he was saying that uh, they'll get rid of the small banks um, and impose a um, um, central bank digital currency. And then you'll have accounts at either the Fed or one of the big banks, and and that'll be it. So we'll have this oligopoly, which we still we kind of have now, but it's an oligopoly in, of, of size with a lot of other small fish in there. But it won't even be the small fish anymore. It'll just be a handful of gigantic banks um, who are basically arms of the Fed, who who oh, who own the Fed. Actually, you know, the Fed is a privately owned entity by the owned by those big banks. So that'll be our financial system then. And um, well, that's one scenario. <laughs> well, well, it, it what, what worries happen. me, what worries yeah. me are all these derivatives so that are also tied to the commercial real estate. So not only do you have the bad loans, the regular commercial uh, excuse me, the regular commercial real estate loans, you also have all these derivatives that are tied to this stuff and we don't know the amount. So you have the commercial real estate mortgage-backed securities. I mean, the Fed had to buy what around three trillion dollars worth of regular residential mortgage-backed securities. In the last crisis, well, well, starting in the last crisis, so over about a 12, 13 year span, the Fed bought about $3 trillion of mortgage backed securities. That's a large chunk of their official balance sheet. 
Yeah, yeah. And and again, the numbers are so much bigger now that anything they did in the past is going to be dwarfed by what they do in the future. So, oh, three trillion? Let's add a zero <laughs> to that. You know, it's going to be that kind of thing. And um, yeah. Um, this this sounds exactly like the book that you wrote in 2014, except, except you're a little early because the, the asset price inflation still went on for another six, seven years until the 2019 repo, repo crisis. And then they lowered the interest rates back down to zero again in 2020 and did all the currency swap lines and stimmy checks and bouts. And then we had one uh, more blow off top in asset prices, it looks like. So this money bubble, well, it's more of a fiat currency bubble because I wouldn't call fiat currencies real money. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, but it is it is kind of funny that James Turk and I wrote that book going on 10 years ago, and it's just now becoming timely. <laughs> you know, timing is everything with an investment book. You know, you've got to uh, you've got to write it, get it through the six months or so of publishing, and then it's got to come out just as the stuff you talked about starts to happen. Well, look ideally. at the Look at the balance sheet increases, though, that the European Central Bank did after you wrote that book. So the European yeah. Central Bank went uh, their balance sheet on a percentage basis. They did more quantitative easing and bought more bonds, ran negative interest rates. They were buying tons of European corporate debt, tons of European Union government debt. So, I mean, like, look at all the rules changes and the central bank balance sheet expansion after you wrote that book. So you didn't know that that was going to happen. Well, um, yeah, the whole QE thing was what uh, was not actually well understood back now, or how far it could go. You know, they, they were doing it in kind of a big way, but we didn't know they could do it that much further. And, um, you know, China, we didn't know China could quintuple their debt and that derivatives could blow up. Anyhow, um, I, I used to have a series back when I ran dollarclaps.com, a series of articles, and it was called um, the, the Long Wave versus the Printing Press. And it was about how, um, you know, the Kondratiev wave and the Elliott wave and the fourth turning. All, there, were, there were all these long wave theories about how societies go through 70 year cycles financially. And all of them say we should have busted in um, 2000, if not before. But the reason that we kept on going so much longer than these long wave theories predicted was because for the first time, everybody in the world, every central bank in the world, has an unlimited printing press. And printing presses are, it turns out, great ways to manipulate markets and fool people into thinking things are okay when they're really not. So we we bought ourselves 20 some extra years of um, what most people would define as reasonably good times. In other words, there are jobs and you can buy a house and people will lend you money and stuff like that. In other words, normality. Uh, but it wasn't normal at all. It was actually the uh, the absolute blow off phase of a multi decade um, credit super cycle, and now here we are. So yeah, we we wrote that. And, book it, and, and it, it's it looks like a math problem now, John. So you say now here we are. I think we're getting towards the end here because I'm looking at all the debt from whether it's Japan, the European Union, uh, Bank of England, English government, their finances, the U.S., China. Emerging markets are all, almost always a mess whenever the dollar rises and interest rates go up and commodity prices fall. So it looks like finally we're having like a global government debt crisis coming soon in the next couple of years, too. Oh, yeah. Um, everything could blow up right now. The uh, interest rates at this level um, create bankruptcy risk for obviously a lot of companies and a lot of individuals, but also for countries. Um, Japan is the poster child for this. They uh, they borrowed insane amounts of money at zero or negative interest rates, which meant their interest costs were next to nothing, even while the government was becoming the most indebted government on a per capita basis that has ever existed in human history. Well, now interest rates are going up. Japan is actually having to pay a positive return on its bonds. They're liquidating their treasuries too. Yeah, they need the yeah. desperately need the dollars. Yes. Yeah. And and so let interest rates go up a little longer. You know, if Japan had to um, pay what the U.S. pays to borrow, and the U.S. is the uh, bluest of blue chips, right? Uh, but if they had to pay what the U.S. has to pay now to, uh, to issue bonds, they're instantly bankrupt. The government will have to pay more in interest than it gets in tax revenue. Um, and the government will then just stop working. So that all, all kinds of things like that are out there waiting to happen. And, and, you know, the U.S. is a lesser example of that, but still pretty extreme. I mean, our, our um, interest cost on the U.S. government debt is going to exceed a trillion dollars next year. 
or maybe by the end of this year, we'll be going at that rate, you know? And um, it's, Yeah, it's up over, it's up over three X. So for our listeners out there, I think in 2021, I think it was around 300 billion a year in interest payments. That's when the Fed just had just started their rate hiking cycle. Now here we are, we're almost, I think around 900 billion a year in interest payments. So like you said, I think over the next six, nine, 12 months, there there's a lot of US Treasury debt that needs to be either reissued or rolled over because obviously we can't pay off the debt. And the the main the other main problem here, John, is that both political parties in DC want to spend more. I mean, even the Biden administration wants to increase the military spending budget by a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we're gonna have a trillion dollar defense budget <laughs> and, and probably a trillion dollar Medicare and Social Security budget and now interest on top of that. But the question is who who would lend money to an entity that is that deeply in debt and is continuing to go more deeply in debt because you know if we have to borrow the trillion dollars in interest payments that we're going to make which means our debt is going to go up which means our interest rates or or our interest costs are going to go up and so on it's a financial death spiral um, if you just look at how the math works who's going to lend that money to us or is the fed just going to buy it all buy, buy all the government debt and then we we enter modern monetary theory territory where we're just financing the government directly with money that's created out of thin air uh, which is the death knell from any kind of fiat currency you know who wants to hold a currency <laughs> that is just being created out of thin air by a government that can't manage its finances in any reasonable way at all so all this stuff is coming. This is uh, a next year thing or a year after thing. And uh, probably some big entity blowing up, some sector blowing up is probably a this year thing. And well, so the, the, it, it's all coming. It's just a question of the sequence in which these things come. Yeah, it looks like the U.S. is being saved for last with these government financing problems. But the normal purchasers of U.S. Treasuries the last 20, 25 years, so China recycling their foreign exchange reserves, their trade surpluses and foreign exchange reserves and buying a lot of U.S. Treasuries, that's not happening. Uh, Japan would normally run trade surpluses and recycle their foreign exchange reserves into more U.S. Treasuries. That's an that's not happening. Germany would normally do that. So the normal large buyers, the large net purchases of US treasuries, those people are gone. Even though interest rates are higher, you'd think that that would attract more buyers, but it's not. Instead, what you're seeing with the People's Bank of China, Russia, India, Singapore, a lot of the non-G7 countries and central banks that are running trade surpluses now, John, they're buying gold tonnage the last 12 months. Well, yeah, governments seem to see this coming. And um, central bank demand for gold is the highest it's ever been, uh, which ought to tell us something. If these guys who, who are basically in charge of the major currencies realize how badly they've screwed up those currencies and are basically trying to get out of them, you know, try, trying to shift as much of their resources as they can into real assets, then we should be doing that too. <laughs> but we know that, right? Anybody who listens to uh, to your podcast series already knows that they need to be buying gold and silver um, and whatever other real asset they can get their hands on. So uh, the the one nice thing about this going on way longer than it seemed like it was going to is that we've had plenty of time to figure out our strategies, right? We all kind of know what we should be doing now. And uh, it's just a question of uh, of doing it, whether we need to get the cash or whether we need to sell financial assets in order to get the cash, whatever we need to do. We know we need to do it. So Hopefully, this spares a lot of people the trauma that they would have had if they weren't ready for it when the time came. So it could be that there's there's going to be this whole generation of extremely rich gold bugs 10 years from now who were right and who rode this thing at, uh, and, and got out just in time and and uh, are now the, the suppliers of capital to a rebuilding world. That would be the best scenario that I can think of. Yeah, I think the commodities are going to have supply side problems, lack of investment for a lot of these commodities, because even though energy prices were high back in 2021 and part of 2022, there wasn't a ton of extra invest, excuse me, there wasn't a ton of extra investment, especially on the supply side and capex for a lot of these oil and natural gas companies. And in a lot of these countries, there was oil and natural gas drilling bans, and then the politicians were threatening windfall profits taxes, and they wanted to build the liquefied natural gas import facility, but they didn't allow any domestic drilling. So just more policy mishaps and screw-ups there and not allowing the free market to fix the supply and demand problems, especially in countries like the European Union. 
Yeah, um, the supply chain thing is going to be a big part of the story going forward because we really haven't fixed that many things, and uh, uh, it, it's completely possible that the uh, the Russia Ukraine thing isn't done breaking stuff yet over there. Both of those countries are such big suppliers of so many things that um, that it's possible that they just never get back to the levels that they were five years ago, and uh, it, the the European energy story is interesting enough for an entire show just by itself because what germany did the mistakes it made um see germany seemed like it was the well-run adult country in, almost in the world up until a few years ago and then they started making mistakes with their energy system and their finances and everything and now um they're they, they look like a bunch of morons you know france looks much smarter than germany <laughs> based on uh, the policies that the those two countries have pursued for a while. But, but anyhow, um, there will be supply bottlenecks in a lot of commodities. And the only way you fix supply bottlenecks is with higher prices <clears throat> that incent people to go out and get more of those commodities. So if we own them now, we'll have the wind at our back, financially speaking. You know, if, uh, if you own a lot of silver miners now, at least the really high quality ones, then when silver goes into shortage and one of the big exchanges defaults and the silver spot price hits $150 an ounce, uh, you're going to feel like a genius. And more importantly, you're going to be equipped to take care of yourself and your family in what is going to be a very chaotic world. So that's what we should be shooting for is, um, um, you know, developing a strategy that allows us to have the capital that we're going to need to when when one of your kids really needs a place to live or that they're going to be because they're going to be homeless otherwise you just step up and take care of it if uh, somebody else is sick and there's an experimental disease or experimental treatment that's going to cost a hundred grand and insurance not going to cover it um take care of it that that's the thing we should be shooting for that that kind of protection against um the vagaries of life uh that are going to be really magnified in the future and I think the commodities markets are the place that's going to um, to to be where we should be for most of this stuff. Copper, same thing, massive shortage. Uh, um, it, it's just going to be a lot of capital trying to get through some, some very small doors. Well, we were and, talking. We were talking before we started. Sorry to interrupt you. We were talking before we started recording that in a lot of cases, I mean, the banks won't even lend to a lot of oil and natural gas companies. Definitely not coal companies, but also mining companies because of ESG policies or other types of mandates. They either left because they didn't think that there would be any demand for certain commodities, or they left because it was uh, considered anti. Uh, it wasn't part of their ESG policy agenda. So oh, especially for a lot of these mining projects, a lot of the Canadian and American, like smaller merchant banks that used to help raise capital for juniors, those guys are gone. So the royalty and streaming companies, there's going to be a vacuum left and a hole to fill. And if there's a lack of capital, I mean, uh, if there's a lack of capital for a lot of these uh, producers for mining companies or oil and natural gas, then the money's not going to be invested into new supply. Yeah, if, if you just buy five stocks going forward, probably the um, the streaming and royalty companies, um, mostly in precious metals, but some of them are in other industries now too, uh, they would be the things to own because that's a, a business model that's tailor-made for this kind of a world because normally um, they, they do great in at the different parts of the business cycle because they tend to have a lot of cash when the cycle turns down and nobody's willing to finance um, emerging mines. So the uh, the streaming companies and the royalty companies can step in and cut really good deals for themselves from these desperate junior miners and exploration companies. And then they make a lot of money uh, in the upswing part of the cycle um, and can raise a lot of capital um, because everybody's so impressed with how much money they're earning. Um, to be ready for the next part of the cycle. And then, as you said, the ESG thing is a wild card here because now, even in pretty good times for precious metals, for instance, or for a lot of other mining, banks are reluctant to lend to them because they've got these uh, they've got these um, these artificial rules that have been imposed on them that um, that keep them out of certain sectors. So it could be that the uh, royalty and streaming companies are basically the main bankers now for exploration companies and for uh, junior miners in general. 
uh, which means they get to cut even better deals going forward. So the, those are the companies you want to own. They they just have a better business model than actual miners because they're the perfect kind of banker or venture capitalist, if you will, uh, for the cycle that's coming, you know, and they're, they'll cut some amazing deals. Say, Let's say we have a, a stock market crash here in the year ahead, which we could easily if something blows up and that sucks down the gold and silver miners. Um, well, the... Um, the royalty and streaming companies are going to have a lot of cash at that point. They will step in and cut some amazingly favorable deals. Um, and in the that, that, that upswing, actually that that actually happened. Let me just provide a case yeah. study, John. So Franco Nevada, which is the largest precious metal royalty and streaming company, they actually bought eighty million dollars in a gold. Uh, they bought, excuse me, over a billion dollars worth of gold from Coeur d'Alene because Coeur d'Alene was bringing a mine online in two thousand nine. Because I was following the industry back then. So Franco Nevada for eighty million in cash to help the miner finish their mine. They bought a gold stream. The eighty million in cash saved the miner from going bankrupt. Franco Nevada bought a billion dollars worth of gold for only eighty million in the two thousand eight. <laughs> 2009 financial crisis yeah. so the, oh go ahead no i was just saying that's a i think one of the best case studies that the model does work even in times of crisis because they have the cash and they're deploying it and they're saving the miner and in the miner they can always if there's a problem with the stream they can renegotiate unlike a bank because the banks aren't going to be as flexible yeah and uh, that's going to happen again in a bigger way this time around now the only um drawback to that sector is that people kind of know that. So those companies are very seldom really cheap. If you have a really sharp break in the stock market, they'll get sucked down too. But in more or less normal times, a lot of capital flows into them and their stocks tend to behave pretty well. So if you already own them, you like them. But if you are if you don't own them and you're looking at them, then you, you kind of, I don't know, I, I would advise lowball bids or uh, writing puts in order to get a cheaper price or something like that. If you just step up and buy them at the market, you still might do great, but um, you've created some downside risk for yourself because they're not cheap at their current prices. But, uh, well, but that- it, it, it depends how much growth the company already has pay, uh, paid for it because I bought Wheaton Precious Metals back when it was Silver Wheaton, I think 2012, 2013, after, as silver prices were crashing. And I've just bought and hold that that stock and I'm almost up 200% with dividend increases over 10 plus years. So I didn't do anything too fancy. I just bought shares of the stock when I thought it was good and they had a lot of future growth and they they had to change their business model because there wasn't a lot of additional silver streams for byproduct to buy at the time. They had to go buy gold streams too. So they started diversifying. And then during that bear market, like you said, they were deploying capital along with Franco Nevada and those large companies like Royal Gold, Franco Nevada, Wheat and Precious Metals, all you have to do is go and pull up a max chart since the 2008 financial crisis. When gold and silver prices were going down, these companies were making investments that have paid off like really, really well now. Yeah, that, I, I agree. Buy and hold is the way to go with those guys. I'm, I'm just saying that if, if we have another uh, 2008 scenario or 2020 scenario where everything just tanks and it, it gets completely crazy to the downside, these things will go down too. Because uh, with um, Wheaton, I bet if we um, pull up a chart of what they did in 2020, for instance, um, we could have gotten it way, way cheaper than its previous three years average or definitely its subsequent average. So things like that will happen. Oh, yeah. Didn't silver didn't silver get down? The paper oh. price of silver got down to about 12, 13, I think, at Sil one point. Silver got smashed and the silver miners got smashed, too. And uh, Wheat and Precious Metals is, is now not just a silver uh, mining company. It's, um, you know, it's got streams of gold and probably other things, too. But but still, um, these companies are at risk of uh, short, dramatic drops. And uh, so that, that would be the only thing that would keep me, if I wasn't in them already, it would keep me from jumping in with both feet because they're great business models. 10 years from now, I'm barring like a nuclear war or something, they are definitely going to make a lot of money. But um, they're, the low in the next cycle might be the best time to get into them. So uh, dollar cost average, you know, put in really low ball bids and hope maybe something happens to scare everybody and it drops to your price, things like that. That's the way to to get into these stocks that everybody knows about and already likes. So is there anything you're actually optimistic about? Because we're discussing that there's bubbles here. There's a fiat currency problem, government debt problem. Uh, these higher interest rates are potentially you think the next crisis is what commercial real estate here in the United States? 
Maybe. Uh, there, there's so many things that can go wrong. Uh, and commercial real estate is one that seems like it's kind of on the front burner because all this debt has to be rolled over. But there's lots of other things that could happen. So, uh, I mean, I wouldn't have guessed three weeks ago that uh, Silicon Valley Bank was going to start a, a, a run on small uh, regional banks. But um, so whatever happens next could be something that's out of left field like that. But there's a bunch of things that could happen. So, uh, you know, we've been doing that whole catalyst watch thing for years now, like what's going to blow up the whole system? And and um, there's still a bunch out there that could happen. So, well, uh, the Fed also has this domestic permanent repo facility that a lot of people are not talking about yet. I don't think anyone's drawn from it, but there's a lot of non-bank financial entities that can actually post toxic garbage collateral there and get cheap interest rate loans, dollar loans there. So uh, we'll see if that gets used in the next crisis with commercial real estate or if the Fed decides to use that as kind of a covert bailout facility. But I know that that one was set up because there was two permanent repo, excuse me, because there was two permanent repo facilities set up in 2020. People are talking about the foreign central bank one that permanent repo facility, but not the domestic one here in the United States. So we'll see if that one gets used to to hide more bailout funds. But my, my last question here for you, John, any is there anything since a lot of the stuff we were talking about was, you know, not so optimistic? Is there anything you're actually optimistic on over the next three, five, seven, ten years? Well, uh, I'm optimistic about gold and silver. You know, the, the things that do well in a crisis I, I think we should be optimistic about, but that means the rest of the world is going to be in bad shape. So um Something that probably is going to do fine no matter what, even if we somehow bypass all these crises and just continue to be, you know, two or three percent growth with three or four percent inflation or something like that, is uranium. Um, basically, what happened was uh, Fukushima, the, the plant in, in Japan, um, melted down. Everybody wanted to bail out of the um, nuclear power market and a lot of um European countries were were at the same time captured by the Greens parties in their their political systems, and so started closing down their nuclear plants and their coal plants, and um, mothballing plants that had a lot of life left in them, and and uh, canceling plans for new nuclear plants and everything. So um, uranium prices went down, and it, be, it became a really kind of dead business for a while. Well, now everybody's changing their minds. They're all going back to nuclear because it turns out that uh, solar and wind have their uses, but they can't be depended on completely um, for a major country. And Germany found that out there. They're in an energy crisis right now because of that. And um, so everybody's building new nuclear plants and they're bringing their old plants back from being mothballed and extending the life of the ones they've got. And that's going to create massive, um, massively higher demand for uranium. So, so it's basically the same story um, structurally as the gold and silver miners. You know, the demand for those things are going to go up. Therefore, the miners are going to do well because what they're selling is going to be more expensive. And, and uh, same thing with uranium. Uh, it, it's completely possible that um, so many new nuclear plants are going to come online in the next few years that the demand for uranium will wildly outstrip what today's mines can supply, which means prices have to go way up to incent new miners to come in and start uh, bringing mines online in an expedited way. And so um, it's possible that uh, we have another bull market in uranium that is as good or better than the face, rip your face off um, bull markets that we've had in the past in that sector. Uh, you know, check Rick Rule out. He's done some good videos on uranium and is very optimistic about it and uh, knows way more about it than I do. But I think Rick Roll, I interviewed Rick yesterday. Yeah, yeah actually, I interviewed another uh, uranium expert, the guy Justin Yoon from Uranium Insider. And he basically said, and Rick Roll has said similar things, that the most of the uranium industry, they can't survive. So in the short term, maybe they can kind of edge along but most of the uranium industry to replace the current mine production, I mean, they can't survive uranium prices below $65, $70, a pound because there's not a lot of low-cost uranium projects left. So you have Kazataprom and Cameco, the two main producers, but they're starting to bring online higher cost production now. Yeah, see, that's when you want to buy into a, a mining sector is when the price of whatever they're mining is below the cost of production because <laughs> because uh, the price has to go up by definition right or else everyone goes out of business and you you have zero supply and that can't be allowed to happen so prices have to go up so you you pick the really really high quality companies that are going to survive no matter what just about and buy into them early on 
and then ride them for a little while. And then when people start getting excited, you move over to the uh, the smaller, riskier ones that uh, another leg up in prices will make hugely profitable. And then, you know, you end up making a lot of money through that cycle. And uh, yeah, the guys who really know uranium seem to think that this is the beginning of that again, because like you said, prices are just too low. They cannot be this low for the industry to exist 10 years from now. And since the industry has to exist because of all these nuclear plants coming on, prices have to go up. So well, um, you, it's, it's a nice you, theme. The, the other part of this that a lot of people don't understand, and a lot of it's these global macro hedge fund guys, which are so short term oriented with their trade. So everything's like by the day, by the week, by the month, by the quarter. No one's thinking about anything, um, the problems with an industry. So you see the Fed raising interest rates, you see the dollar is still relatively strong. What they don't understand is all these input costs for a lot of these companies, the mining companies, the oil and natural gas companies. So the labor costs, the cost of capital, um, electricity in a lot of different countries, uh, unless you're here in the US where you have cheap natural gas prices now, all these costs, chemical costs, materials costs to build a new mine, all these costs are up across the board and that means the replacement costs, um, maintenance capex, maintenance capital expenditure bills. Those costs are going to be way, way higher just to maintain the same levels of production. So bringing on new production is going to be even more expensive. Yes. Yeah. And um, so the guys who are set now with um, plenty of supply are going to do very well. So, yeah. The, so, so you know it's it's possible to be optimistic about sectors even in a world that doesn't inspire much optimism and that's kind of where we are now you know there there are very few really uplifting positive stories out there um that um that involve the rest of the world <laughs> but there's a lot of really exciting stories that involve one sector that does well if the rest of the world goes to hell and uh, I, I think that's kind of the the approach that you have to take now is looking at uh, crisis related assets that are going to do well when most other things are doing really badly. So John, I want to thank you so much for your time today. You no longer run the dollar collapse website. You now have a sub stack. So please tell my listeners about that. Yeah. Um, um, I have a Substack newsletter. It's uh, rubino.substack.com. And it's uh, dedicated mostly to actionable stuff. In other words, we all kind of know the story now, right? The, all these things are happening in the world. Uh, so what do we do about it? And that's, uh, I've got the content there kind of divided between lots of free stuff that covers the, the generalities. And then behind a paywall is actionable stuff like stock lists and and strategies and things like that. So you can come on, um, you know, sign up for the free part, check it out, see what you think. And then if it looks like the actionable stuff is worthwhile, then you go behind the paywall. I also recommend for our listeners out there, because it's probably pretty cheap now on Audible, go and buy John's audiobook because it was a little bit early. The central banks, the governments and central banks played a ton of games after that book came out and they did a ton of asset price inflation with the Cantillon effect. I mean, the central bank balance sheet expansion over the last like seven, eight, 10 years is just absolutely enormous. No one thought that they could actually get away with it. And yet they did. I mean, the European Union and the European Central Bank even ran negative interest rate policy, and that that helped blow them up, too, besides their bad energy policies. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And as we talked about, the book is 10 years old and it's finally timely. So, yeah, it's uh, it's available on Amazon, probably for a, a reasonable price now since it's uh, it's been out for a while. And there's a history of currency swap lines, as John and James talk about in the book, over past crises. If your listeners are curious about that, I've used that for research in the past for articles about currency swap lines. But the, the bottom line is that these currency swap lines, every crisis going back decades, it just seemed to get larger. And now with the problems, the sheer size of the problems with the derivatives market, the euro dollar, all these new derivatives that the Wall Street investment banks create. And really since 2008, what they've created an enormous amount of residential mortgage-backed securities. They've created an enormous amount of commercial real estate mortgage-backed securities. They've created an enormous amount of worse and junk bonds these really bad collateral corporate debt that they chopped up into collateralized loan obligations as income products. No one knows the exact numbers on these things, but these things are in the trillions. And unfortunately, I think that the currency swap lines, John, it seems to be one of the favorite things for hidden covert bailouts by the central banks, especially the Fed, but to other central banks to prevent these um, Deutsche Bank or Credit Suisse from um, ha uh, collapsing and causing like a domino effect throughout the 
European and U.S. banking systems. Agreed. You know, there are so many things that can go wrong and there, there are so many things they're hiding from us and much of it will come out, probably not all of it, but much of it will come out. So this is going to be riveting as, as it plays out.